Good morning, Bob Stockberger with you on this snowy uh, Sunday morning. We are having no church in our building, but we're having it online because of this snowstorm. It's so nice to have you with us today. Today we're talking about having no fear and a sword. Now what in the world does all of that mean? Jesus said, I've come with a sword. You're supposed to bring peace. So what's that all about? And what's about all the, the fear that we're not to have? So some very interesting verses that we're going to pick right up. If you will, pick up your Bibles and uh, or on your devices and turn to Matthew 10. We're going to start with verse 26 through 33. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are you not are two sparrows not sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the father but even the hairs of your head are numbered fear not you are more valuable than many sparrows so everyone who acknowledges me before men i will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven but whoever denies me before man, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. These are some interesting words. And we don't shy away from more difficult passages as we go through uh, all of God's Word. But the first thing Jesus talks about right here is have no fear of them. The them is, in the preceding verse, those who have charge Jesus with being Satan. They've called him, his power, that of Satan. And he says, don't fear them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed um, or that's been whispered to you that I don't want you to proclaim from the housetops. So he now tells his disciples, it's time to proclaim what I've been teaching you, what you've heard in our small group. We want to get out and proclaim it to the world. And do not fear those who can't destroy your body. The only one to fear is God. And yes, that word fear for God means fear. It also means awe. But what did the angel say? What did God say? Every time he appeared to man, he says, fear not. Because when you're in the presence of a holy, awesome God, I'm going to be quivering. I'm going to be fearful. Not in a bad way, but I'm just in awe. And I'm going to fear. I'm going to be on my face. I've told you that over and over. Down on my face, flat out laying on my belly. Lord, I'm in your presence. We are to have all and yes, fear for God because he controls everything, our soul and our life and our body. He is our awesome God. Now, Jesus <clears throat> tells us not to be afraid and then he wants us to proclaim him before men. And this word that he uses, acknowledge me before men, means to bring honor, to bring honor to God. And it's the same Greek word that we get homily from. When you make a homily, you are praising God as you proclaim him. Proclaim me Acknowledge me, honor me before men, and I will acknowledge you before my Father. But the other word that he uses is very interesting. If you do not do honor him, and he uses this word, denies me. Well, the Greek word there has some very interesting meaning. 
And I think it means repudiate also, but most importantly in this verse, I think this word points to the word disown. If you disown me, says God, I will disown you before God. If you disown me before men, I'm going to disown you before my Father in heaven. And that's pretty strong to disown Jesus. But we are to proclaim him. We are to proclaim him to others because he is the only way to heaven. Acts 4.12 is a great example of this. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation is from no one else. For there is no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Faith in Jesus is exclusive. You either believe him and trust him or you don't. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Have you ever been afraid of sharing Christ? Have you ever been afraid in any circumstance proclaiming Christ? Well, I have. I'll admit that. 25 years ago, roughly, about this time of year, on a mission trip, I've been on many mission trips, but this was to India. We were in a small village. During the day, we would have medical clinics, and at night, we would preach. And this night, we were in the village. A few hundred people were there, and we were preaching, and, and it was about my turn. And all of a sudden, a bunch of men, it seems like hundreds to me, probably wasn't near that many, with torches lit, surrounded this whole group and started chanting communist slogans and trying to intimidate us. Our Indian host said to me, Bob, get up there and preach. And I will tell you, I was a little nervous because the flesh is weak, but the Spirit is willing, isn't it? The Holy Spirit literally lifted me up, propelled me to that microphone, and away I went proclaiming the Lord. Not because I am great, but he who is within me is great. The amazing thing at the close of that service, after me came our senior pastor and he preached. And then in India, you just asked for a decision by raising your hand. There were a dozen or more people who raised their hands in the midst of this audience, surrounded by torches and their fellow villagers threatening them. That was an amazing sight because when you raise your hand in India, if you're Hindu, you immediately lose your mother and father. They disown you. You lose your brothers and sisters. You probably lose your job. You lose your family burial plot. You lose a lot of things. But over a dozen hands came up to proclaim Christ in that fearful environment. So Jesus clearly is telling us not to be afraid. In our culture now, you know, we do face ridicule. We, people have even lost their jobs because of their faith. Our culture is becoming further and further away from God and more and more hostile towards people of faith. I'm going to close with an example that will vividly illustrate that. But one of the biggest fears we have is not knowing enough. Oh, I don't know the Bible well enough. I haven't been in enough Bible studies. Well, that's just not the case. Yes, we all need to be more focused on our Bible study, but the Holy Spirit will give you words, will give you words to proclaim. And so that is a fear. But the biggest fear is that of rejection by your loved ones your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers to whom you proclaim Christ. 
We are afraid of rejection. And that's our biggest fear. Jesus tells us to have no fear of them. Even if they persecute you, have no fear of them. God loves you. He knows every hair on your head. You are valuable to him. You are a son or a daughter. And he wants you to proclaim from the rooftops his truth. May we never disown Jesus. Now, what about this sword? As we read, starting in verse 34, the last part of this uh, chapter, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be of their own household. Whoever loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So there we have one of the most astounding verses in the New Testament, right there in verse 33. I have not, do not think I've come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring, bring peace, but a sword. Jesus saying two times, and you know good and well, when he repeats those verses, when he repeats that thought, it's important. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I'm sure many of you have scratched your heads over this verse. Many of you have said, what in the world does this mean? This may be the first time you've heard this verse. But a sword, obviously, the Greek word is a sword. It can also mean bring war. That doesn't help a whole lot. But I think if we look at another couple of verses, it'll help us understand this. In Hebrews 4, 12, listen to this. <clears throat> For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division, or for the purpose of division, of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword for the purpose of division of the body and the soul and of our intentions and our thoughts. When Jesus comes again, you remember in Revelation 19, the sword's coming from his mouth as he conquers his enemies. But right here, we know that Jesus is not coming to conquer his enemies. That's for his second coming. He comes now as the Lamb of God, not the Lion of Judah, which he will do at the end of time. But he comes, he says, with the sword. So I think if we look at that sword as something that separates that separates or divides our thoughts and our uh, desires. It separates, as he, the next verse says, he sometimes separates us from our families. Because right there it says, father will be turned against daughter, vice versa. All that list of um, the people going against each other in the family come right from Micah 7 verse 6. And all of them are the younger persons going against the older, just like teenagers against their parents. That's gone on since the beginning of earthly time. So Jesus, I think, is meaning this sword separates us from those who believe and those who don't believe. He says about a little bit about loving him more than family. It doesn't mean that we do not love our family. 
of all people on this earth, that's who we love the most. But the love of God comes above that. And if God leads us in this direction and our family says, no, we don't want you to go. We want you to go this way. And God says this way, we love God more and we choose God's way. Don't you see? We love both. But God, our love for God has to take priority. And that's what he is saying. We also are told that we're to take up our cross. Now, in the first century, that really meant something. People in the first century saw crosses on the road all the time with people hung up there naked, nailed to crosses or tied to crosses, dying an agonizing death, an embarrassing death, a horrible death. When Jesus told his disciples to take up their cross, they knew what it meant. So often now we say, oh, I bear my cross. I bear my cross on this and that. No, in the first century, when you took up a cross, you were going to be hung on it. You were going to die a horrible death. The disciples failed. You remember, he says, follow me and take up your cross. They didn't follow him. When Jesus fell down and couldn't carry his cross, he had to get a stranger to finish that task. We fall down too. We fail. We don't follow Jesus all the time. But he restores us and loves us. And he tells us in no uncertain terms. If we want to find our own life, we're going to lose it. If we will give our life and lose our life, if you will, to Jesus, yes, we will find it. As I close, there's a vivid example of how we face persecution in America today. I read an article recently about a late night <clears throat> talk show host who was a, a very um, overwhelmingly atheist and, and is very outspoken about his atheist beliefs. And he was ridiculing evangelical Christians. He was saying this about evangelical Christians. Please, magical religious thinking is a virus. And QAnon, a, a crazy um, cult think, is just its current mutation. So when you are an evangelical Christian, you have magical thinking like this fantasy of a cult. You're, you're not coupled to reality. He went on later as I read the transcript to ridicule Revelation and some of the things I just pointed out. Jesus coming with a sword from his mouth. And he says, like watching an Avenger movie, a Hobbit movie, plus going out with Johnny Depp. I don't know what any of that means. I'm sure he laughed and people thought it was funny, but it was sad. When I hear people mocking Jesus, when I hear people disowning Jesus, the word we studied two or three weeks ago, my colon quivers, my gut wrenches, my heart aches. All those are what that word means that we talked about for compassion. My heart aches and I, my gut wrenches for that comedian, for anyone who blasphemes and makes fun of Jesus, disowning him. Because, yes, this popular person may have found life on this earth and wealth and people loving him and fans, so on and so forth. But the one he should fear is the one who has control of his body and his soul. And that is the very person he mocks. So that is what I'm saying in this day and age, more and more and more, we will be mocked. We will be ridiculed. We will be flash mobbed. And yes, we might even face physical harm and even death by proclaiming our faith. We may lose our job. Our business may be boycotted. We will face persecution. 
And that's only going to get worse. But we are to have faith because Jesus says he comes to cast out our fear. We are not to fear those. Jesus comes with a sword. He will divide and show those who love him and should those who don't. And we are to have compassion and our heart should ache for those who reject Jesus. There is no middle ground, Jesus says, with that sword. We're divided. There is no middle ground. And may we all acknowledge, honor him in our lives and not fear the mob, not fear the persecution, not fear to proclaim from the housetops that Jesus is Lord. We are never, may we take up our cross and follow him and may we never, ever, ever disown him. So with this division, where do you stand today, this Sunday? Where do you stand in this division that Jesus has brought about? Where does your family stand? All oh, brothers and sisters, I pray you will all stand with Jesus. Acknowledge him, honor him, and proclaim him with no fear every day of your life. Pray with me. Father God, it is so easy to be quiet. It is so easy to keep our mouth closed. It's so easy to walk away from opportunities that you put in front of us almost every day to proclaim your word. Lord, we admit we have fear at times, but your perfect love casts out fear. Your Holy Spirit will give us the words. May we never fear those who persecute you. Father, may we never disown you. May we never walk away from you. But may we acknowledge, honor you with our lives and the actions that we proclaim and the words that we speak. May our lives in word and in deed proclaim your holiness until you come again. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed our sermon today. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you feel led to accept Him, please email me right there on the screen. I would love to talk to you about your personal walk with Jesus. If you have other questions about your faith, please don't hesitate to email me. Glad to talk about that. May God bless you this week. May His face shine upon you and give you strength to stand tall and acknowledge and honor Him and not to fear any of His opponents. God bless you, folks.